Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bloomberg Business Week weekend podcast. A deluge of U.S. economic reports this past week, including durable goods orders falling more than forecast, consumer confidence decreasing for the first time in four months, the U.S. economy expanding at a slower rate at the end of last year as consumer spending grew at a faster pace than initially estimated, and inflation was revised higher. And then we got the big report of the week. The Fed's favored inflation gauge rose in January at the fastest pace in nearly a year, although it did come in exactly as forecast. Inflation-adjusted consumer spending dropped for the first time in five months after a robust holiday shopping season. And real disposable income, the main supporter of spending, was little changed. More on that latest inflation print and the U.S. economic backdrop in just a moment. Uh, Carol, you were not joking when you said a deluge of economic data. (laughs) It was hard to keep up. All right. Also this hour, we got another check on the U.S. economy and really U.S. consumers, thanks to Whirlpool CEO Mark Bitzer, who continues to see consumers changing their shopping ways post-pandemic. Plus, as U.S. home buying demand nears its worst level since 1995, as mortgage rates hold above 7%. We got a check of the housing market with Kate Kaminsky, COO at the real estate investment company Walton Global. And folks, yes, we may be a couple of months in, but there are still those who are making calls for the new year. We have the 10 outrageous predictions for private equity in 2024. And speaking of that, we check out the PE back studio behind everything from auteur driven Oscar bait, such as Uncut Gems to the streaming award winning hit Beef. It's the Business Week cover story. All of that to come. We begin with the nonstop U.S. economic data this week. And in particular, the report that was the big one and the latest read on U.S. inflation, which also happens to be the Fed's preferred inflation gauge. We're talking about the core personal consumption expenditures gauge, or core PCE, which increased by the most in a year. For more, we checked in with Bloomberg News international economics and policy correspondent Michael McKee. The sigh of relief was uh, it wasn't worse. The numbers came in on a month-over-month basis higher than they had in previous months. The core rate was up on a month-over-month basis, four-tenths, which was the highest in a year, and it sounds terrible. But because of base effects and the the progress they've made on disinflation on the year-over-year basis, we continued to see the PCE and the core go down. And that's what people want to see because that's what the Fed wants to see. Uh, We're still a ways from 2% if you're using core as sort of your measuring stick. Uh, at 2.8 percent, but there was progress, and the economy's not doing badly. People, boy, personal income went up uh, one percent, and uh, wages still went up four tenths of a percent, which is healthy. And spending was a little weak, but remember, there was a lot of storms in January. People didn't go out. We know they didn't buy cars and things like that. So overall, this is the Goldilocks soft landing story continued. So break open the champagne, in other words. I knew you'd get around to that. (laughs) So, Mike, remind us why this is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. Why why do we care so much about PCE and over CPI, for example? Well, basically, the, the PCE is a bit broader, but it also is a little bit more reflective of what people are spending on. It includes a lot of imputed data, which is data that they they try to figure out by measuring parts of the economy rather than just prices because they don't uh, have prices on things like uh, financial, uh, like portfolio management was one of the biggest movers up 5% on the month because the markets are doing so well. Right. So they're looking at the markets and they're looking at the gain in the markets and they're guessing sort of at what the commissions would be, et cetera, and uh, the fees, and, and they impute a number from that. But that's not counted in the CPI. And uh, for example, the, um, the, the CPI will measure what you pay for your monthly car insurance, whereas the PCE will measure what you pay and it also measures what value you get. In other words, how much will your policy pay if you're in an accident? And of course, that has to keep 
likely going up because cars keep getting more expensive. So uh, that's the kind of thing that, that's the difference between them. And so the Fed just prefers it. It, it. They normally don't run very far apart, but they have been running far apart over the last year. Well, as an economist, I mean, what do you trust as really kind of telling the true picture of, it, of inflation? Because I do feel like there's a bit of a debate when it comes to some of the economic statistics that are out there about <laughs> whether they not, you know, accurately reflect what's going on in the U.S. economy. How do you see it? Because I feel like, Mike, you're so good at kind of pulling in, yes, government statistics, real world, real world statistics. There are so many different measures. And even though there's a wedge between the PCE and CPI, it's about uh, 100 basis points now. It's normally somewhere between 30 and 50 Hmm. so it's not very wide and really we can't say given all the different measures exactly what inflation is right so the cpi has the most categories it's the most up to date the ppi and the uh, cpi feed into pce so pce depends on cpi so i guess i would go with the cpi that doesn't mean i think that 3.9 percent is is uh, where we should be um there's a lot of talk of the Fed maybe changing its inflation mm-hmm. target to, to maybe 3% or something like that. But um, overall, maybe the CPI, but it, it, you know. That's just talk. The Fed has denied that they're going to do that many, many times over the last year. Well, they're denying it now because if you do it now, when you have you're this moving situation, the you're moving the goalposts. Right. They do now have a procedure so that every five years they look at their monetary policy framework, and that's coming up in 2025. So do you think that given what we've, ha- we've seen over the last 18 months with the data, Mike, that they would consider actually changing it when there is a time to do that? I think they would. Two um, percent was never a, a, a number written in stone. It was what the New Zealand uh, Central Bank adopted a uh, number of years ago, and it sort of became a de facto standard. And the idea was basically what's not too high and not too low. Because if, you, if you're too what's low, the you, you, you have no right. way to lower rates if you're right. at, at zero. Uh, and if you're too high, then people get mad because you have inflation. So they pick 2%. They could easily pick 3%. And people have been urging that on them for years. So it's something I'm sure they'll talk about. All right. So the data this week, we all were kind of leading up, I feel like, in a big way to this Thursday report of um, PC uh, core and the read on inflation that the Fed follows. The narrative, if you put it all together, including some of the other data points, is there one clear narrative or a bit of a mixed narrative? Uh, it's, a, it's a mostly clear narrative that okay. the economy is doing well. Interesting number we haven't mentioned and didn't get a lot of attention because of the PCE was pending home sales really mm-hmm. tanked in the last month. And that's maybe a sign that we're seeing the higher mortgage rates bite, which is, uh, despite <laughs> Elizabeth Warren's desires, that's what the Fed wants to see. Right. So uh, we seem to be doing and getting what the Fed is, is looking for. That was Bloomberg News international economics and policy correspondent Michael McKee. And staying with the U.S. economy, data, great for reading the temperature on how the economy and consumers are doing. So, too, is going straight to the CEOs of companies that sell directly to us shoppers. Yeah, we get great reads, right, on what's going on. One such company is Whirlpool, which saw explosive demand, as you know, during the pandemic when we were all stuck at home and has really been going through a reset like so many other consumer facing companies as the world has moved back to pre pandemic levels of activity and wanting to kind of get out and do things. Mark Bitzer is the chairman, president, CEO and COO of Whirlpool. We asked him how the consumer is doing following this week's U.S. consumer confidence, which decreased for the first time in four months as Americans' views deteriorated about the outlook for the economy, the job market, and financial conditions. I mean, obviously, our uh, purchase like a durable appliance is is heavily driven by consumer confidence and housing in general. So what we did see already the last year is that actually our replacement side of a business, where people just expl- um, replace a product under the rest, that has been very strong and even up. But the discretionary side, we actually already last year saw coming back, coming down. Um, but large as a result of if interest rates rising, housing kind of being very slow and slowing down throughout the year, that ultimately depressed the, the discretionary side. So what you're describing, we saw already last year, and we probably, I mean, in our earnings call also, we said it's probably gonna be around us, certainly for Q1 and Q2. Um, and then we need to see what happens if interest and mortgage rates and everything else. But I think there, there needs to be a catalyst from that side to really lift consumer sentiment. Well, what would that catalyst be, Mark? Like, what are you looking for at the perch of Whirlpool? 
Yeah, I mean, particularly for a North American business, which, you know, there's, there's a strong correlation with uh, existing mm -hmm. home sales and housing market in general. Um, we always, we shouldn't forget that, you know, the average mortgage rates, which are right now locked in with homeowners is 3.7%. So I think to really bring supply on the market and getting people ready to sell their existing homes, I think you need to see mortgage rates, you know, certainly below 6%, probably more like 5.5% to really kind of unfreeze the market again. Because, you know, what we saw the last two years is the market pretty much dropped from 6.4 million existing home sales to 3.8. That's a dramatic drop. Um, we call it a shock freeze. Um, and it takes that momentum or the catalyst on the interest rate side to kind of unfreeze or fall the market. And, and that's what we, I mean, we don't see it short term. I mean, and of course, well, everybody has got to watch what the Fed will do. Um, but I think over time, it will kind of be a key catalyst for growth. So make that that connection for our investor audience about that key catalyst here and, and why a person who is sitting at a 3.5, uh, 3.75% mortgage won't necessarily go out and buy a new appliance from Whirlpool. But if they were to sell that home to somebody at a favorable mortgage rate, that person moving in would then buy a new appliance from Whirlpool. Why wouldn't the person who lives there now end up buying it if it actually need, if they actually need a new washer or dryer? Yeah. So, so again, I mean, if it just needs a new washer and dryer, we would see that as a replacement market. And, and, you know, it's again, if you break down and let me zoom out a little bit, break down our fundamental demand. Our demand has replacement, has discretionary and new homes. These are basically our fundamental free demand drivers. Replacement is very strong because what we see in post COVID um, and of certainly during COVID, people spend more time at home. So the appliance usage is higher, high usage rates drive early replacement. So that side of business is very strong and we see that today. But, the, but what is right now soft is the discretionary side, which in particular comes with existing home sales. And over many decades, what we typically saw kind of the one month before and the month after people buying a new home or existing home, that's when you have increased purchase and appliance and everything. So, so because what we typically see with people moving in, one of the first things they might do is replace the kitchen or at least replace the appliances. So, so that part of the demand is today missing. And again, it's, it, think about yourself, if you're a homeowner, you're locked in at 3.7, um, rate, I mean, it's, are you willing to, to kind of refinance or buy a new home where mortgage rate right now is 6.8 or 6.9%? No. <laughs> uh, the chances are low, okay? That's right now what we see in the market and you can't blame the consumer for that. Mark, I feel like you're describing me, you know, we bought a new hot water heater because we had to, we didn't have a choice, right? That was replacement. Um, we thought about maybe purchasing something else new that we didn't need to and discretionary and we said, you know, we're gonna not do it right now. So like, I totally get what, what you say um, is going on. Having said that, then let's talk a little bit about your investor day and some of what you're doing. Uh, our team writing up how you guys are going to focus or are, are focusing on smaller appliances. It seems to be maybe what consumers are willing to spend money on. The margins are better. Talk to us a little bit about that strategy and how it can move the needle, especially when it comes to top line growth and margin growth. Yeah. So, so Carol, what we what we spoke about is, you know, as a company, we've been in a multi-year what we call portfolio transformation. And what it basically meant is um, over the past decades, we've had a fairly dispersed global business. Um, mm -hmm. We were from China to Chile in all places of the world. And what we've decided on the majors business, but we want to focus on the markets where we have an, an undeniable strong position, which of us, the Americas, North America, South America, we have good business in India, and that's what we'll focus on. So we, over the years, we sold off the majority of our China business, we sold off Russia, and right now we're just in the kind of final weeks before we can close our European transaction where we would only have a, a smaller portion of the business. So with that, we have a fundamentally different business portfolio. One essentially of it's the major business in the Americas and India, and we have our small domestic appliance business. That was, in some ways, you could describe it as a hidden gem from the past because it was hidden in, in the segment report results of all the different regions. But if you look at that, that is probably, um, it's our strongest brands. It has passion across all demographics and age groups. Um, and we, we feel we have a license to grow that business, um, certainly from a consumer perspective. So, um, and a lot of our resources going forward will go into our small domestic appliance business because it's certain one which we love, strong margins and an exceptionally strong consumer position. How small, or what percentage is, is the smaller appliance business, Mark, right now in terms of revenues and how big do you think it could become if we look at the kind of revenue pie? Yeah, so today it, it is quote unquote only a $1 billion business, but mm -hmm. it has 50% EBIT margin. So it's a very margin attractive business. Um, but, you know, our presence in, 
if you look at the categories of small domestic appliances, it's largely small, it's largely stand mixers and associated products. But we have so much opportunity to grow in coffee, and we just announced today also we will bring a fully automatic espresso maker in May this year um, in other parts of business. So we strongly believe there's ample opportunity to grow that business. Hey, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, cost cutting that you're targeting right now across the different uh, business lines after incurring significant increases back in 2022 and in 2021, Mark. Um, Where within the business are you finding these savings? Yeah, so first of all, to put it in context, it's, you know, in the COVID years, we basically had more than two and a half billion of additional costs. That was a big inflation wave, not only raw materials in all parts of the business. Last year, we we clawed back 800 million of that. And this year, we're targeting another 500 million. So we're not even fully back to pre-COVID cost levels. The opportunities which we see this year, and that's a little bit different from last year, we don't see a lot of tailwinds from raw materials. So we pretty much expect steel and oil and everything else to remain rather stable for us. But we do see opportunity on on cost takeout on products. We do see further opportunities to reduce logistic cost because it's it's a massive cost element for us because we're shipping big bulky products and <laughs> they just drive a lot of cost on the logistics side. But we're also looking at our overall called overhead and infrastructure. And what I mean with that is, you know, global business required a fairly complex global organization. With a more focus on our Americas, we have an opportunity to radically also simplify how we organize and that also drives some cost savings. I do wonder, too, looking at your balance sheet, we have this really great story, a Bloomberg exclusive today. It's among our most read about how companies who have been so addicted to debt um, are now seeking equity. So thinking about selling shares rather than tapping um, the debt markets if they need money. You guys, what's your plan to do? leverage your balance sheet specifically, which has grown as you've done some acquisitions? Um, and I do wonder if investors can kind of still count on the dividend going forward, the sustainability of the dividend market and just got about a minute or so left. Yes. So let me first start start straight away with dividend. We paid our dividend for 69 years, 69. Um, and in none of the 69 years, we ever had a dividend reduction. Um, actually, in the, out of the last of the last 10 years, in eight years, we had a dividend increase. So we we are so that's a yes. <laughs> yeah, that is a, well, of course, it, every single dividend payment requires a board approval. But right. I would I would say this statement publicly if I don't feel the board feels very strongly about it. So we are we strongly believe in dividend, and we have a funds to pay the dividend, and 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 more importantly, we have a basic a guideline internally where we say um, over the last three years we look at the average EPS, and we typically pay out 30, 35 percent of that EPS over the last three years, and we're, we're pretty much on on track on this one. So more to so more to the balance sheet is first of all keeping us in mind we have 1.6 billion dollar for cash on hand. Right. Um, that's a public number. So what we do want to do, and you know, we we knew exactly when we acquired the the incinerator business in Wisconsin, which is hugely margin attractive with a strong position. We knew, of course, it's it's a heavily owned balance sheet, and we okay. said we need two or three years to kind of digest that acquisition related debt. We paid last year down 500 million. We will pay down this year 500 million. So what we guided today in Midwest today is kind of, yeah, by 26, we want to be roughly in a two, two okay. times net debt, debt leverage. So we feel Got we're it. on the right path, kind of re, de-risk, if you want to say so, um, and, and use the balance sheet to the levels where we want to have it. So appreciate Covered so much ground as you always do. Mark Bitzer, be well. Look forward to uh, always our next conversation. Chief Executive Officer at Whirlpool. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. We did get uh, a batch of economic news earlier, but one report that we wanted to um, check out was what happened with sales of previously owned U.S. homes rising in January by the most in nearly a year. Buyers taking advantage of lower mortgage rates at the start of the new year of 2024. Okay, at the start of the year, because right. uh, just yesterday we reported how U.S. mortgage rates jumped above 7% for the first time since early December. That dealt a blow to the housing market's nascent recovery. So the rates issue is certainly sticking with us. Yeah, so let's get to it uh, and what it all means. Kate Kaminsky is Chief Operating Officer of the privately owned and a- asset and real estate investment company. It is Walton Global. They've got about $3.6 billion in assets and over 94,000 acres under management here in the United States. She joins us, Kate does, from Scottsdale, Arizona. Kate, welcome to Bloomberg Business Week. Um, nice to have you here with Tim and me. How are you? And talk to us 
about your world because you guys do commercial, industrial, residential, real estate. Give us um, kind of an overview of how things are going better than the last year, better than the last six months. What can you tell us? Yeah, we're uh, pretty excited about 2024 here at Walton. We really focus on the land space. Uh, we're we're buying land in the path of growth, predominantly to sell to uh, public new home builders. Uh, but we also, as as you noted, have um, industrial, commercial, and and retail holdings. Um, so the numbers that came out today you know, really important in terms of what we're seeing in the resale market, which has a direct impact on on the new home building space, uh, which is is where we focus uh, with with the, the resale figures seeing um, uh, you know, the the slowest year for the last three decades in 2023, we're excited that January was uh, finally an uptick in terms of, of the resale market and, and, you know, that continued increase in value. I think we were at about 5% in, in increase in, in existing home sale value year over year. So strong numbers on the resale market. Um, but you know, still seeing a a continued push for buyers to that that new home market um, because of of a lot of the lock in effect that we're seeing from those mortgage rates, which as as you noted, are are creeping up a bit. Hey, Kate, how would you characterize demand from the home builders right now? Because you guys have property all over the United States. You got a lot in Colorado, a lot in California, Oklahoma, Texas, Florida, Georgia. How would you characterize the demand that you're seeing from home builders who want to buy that land and then build homes on it? I mean, home builder sentiment is is up. I, I think it was at uh, 44 um, percent. We're we're seeing more transactions go under contract right now um, than than we did is certainly a, a year ago. Which 2023 was a, a good year here at Walton. We've got around 2.8 billion in in deal volume. That's that's at various stages. Um, you know, hoping to move that towards closing. Um, so we're we're still seeing a lot of demand, um, but certainly builders are looking to take positions right now. Um, permits are are up just across the board. We we've seen a year of month over month increases. And I think right now we're we're sitting at just over a million um, units at an annualized rate, which is up thirty five percent year over year. So. You know, permits showing us what what we can expect for the future, mm-hmm. what what our forecasts are looking like. What's land prices look like right now? So, you know, like like everything else, um, we we continue to see that increase, um, but it's it's remaining somewhat consistent. And and where we're um, really seeing a lot of our negotiations take place is working with builders on understanding what development costs are going to be, timelines, and and working to ensure that everyone's margins are are really con- remaining consistent and hitting those targets that they're looking but, for. But for you, for the acquisition costs, are land prices going up? And I'm, I'm curious if there's, I'm assuming there are geographical differences. I mean, I know I've got a lot of family down south and it's kind of on fire right now. So if you can give us some context uh, as you look across across um, the United States where you're seeing land values go up a lot because that's that's your bread and butter, right? Yeah, I you know, our assets are really um, focused in the southern half of the United States. Uh, if, if I were to pull our acquisitions team or, or talk to any of the builders, I, I mean, land prices are going up right across the board and it's it's getting uh, more and more difficult to find uh, to find any deals. I, I would say they're they're uh, few and far between right now. Um, the markets that we're really focusing on uh, continue to be Florida, Texas, uh, Georgia and the Carolinas and and then you know of course um, in in the southwest and, and west as well. Um, but but definitely seeing increases in land values. And a lot of that has to do with the lack of supply of, mm-hmm. of development ready land. Uh, we continue to see significant challenges right across the country um, as it pertains to land getting approved for development. Um, this is a, a challenge that, that builders and, and landowners are facing across the board um, as we have more municipalities really restricting 
um, especially that that high density residential. You're listening to the Bloomberg is, Business Week podcast. Country, Listen frankly, live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on in, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto sectors. with the Bloomberg yeah, Business app. You can also listen live on yeah, Amazon yeah, Alexa yeah. from our flagship okay, New our, York station. Our Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. As sort of a, a middle person in this market, because perhaps some of them are asking themselves, well, why, do, why doesn't the landowner go directly to the developer uh, and actually make more money when they sell that? What is the, what's the value that you bring to the transaction by holding onto the land from the landowner to the developer? Well, that's a great question. And, and our, our entire business is, is really focused right now on feeding builders, you know, demand for just-in-time inventory. Just-in-time inventory is, is as simple as, you know, builders post Great Recession uh, were, were penalized significantly for holding long-term land assets that were not income generating, that they weren't going to turn in, call it a t- uh, two-year time frame. So Walton comes in, we buy these land assets and we sell them to builders typically you know on a phase by phase basis mm-hmm. um, over time as they're ready to take it down and 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 start development and ultimately build a home and so we're we're kind of in that land banking space right. um for those of you familiar with the term um which is is something that we're seeing right across the board every builder is really being forced to to utilize that tool in their toolbox right so it's not kind of stuck on their balance sheet especially if there's any kind of downturn. Kate, got 30 seconds left here. Uh, in terms of what you are seeing, are you setting up for a U.S. economy that's recovering, that's growing, that might have a recession? And just real quickly, 25 seconds if you could. Definitely looking at growth. I mean, if you just look at the population numbers from last year alone, I think it was the largest one-year population increase in history. That plus you know, the builders continuing to buy down uh, rates for for new home buyers. I think we're going to see really strong figures uh, in in the balance of this year and and in the economy in general. All right. Going to leave it on that note. Kate, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Kate Kaminsky, Chief Operating Officer of the privately owned uh, asset and real estate investment company, Walton Global, joining us from Scottsdale, Arizona. Home builders as a group, they're up about one and a half percent here in 2024. uh, And we're seeing, yeah, them up a little bit higher as well today. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Well, this past week, we learned that Leon Black sold Apollo Global Management stock for the first time, making the move almost three years after he exited the buyout giant that made him one of Wall Street's richest billionaires. Black unloaded nearly $173 million of stock in the New York-based firm last week. That's according to a regulatory filing. It's almost 2% of his stake in the Alternative Asset Manager, which has seen its shares rise about 480% since going public 13 years ago. So, Tim, you might recall after a tumultuous period, Leon Black retired as Apollo's chief executive officer. That was in March of 2021, after three decades atop one of the world's most powerful investment firms, which is now run by fellow co-founder Mark Rowan. Private equity, it's a huge part of how money moves around today, which is why it was a lot of fun to catch up with Antoine Dreen, founder and chairman of Triago. It's a placement agent that's best known for assisting private equity firms with fundraising. Since 1992, the company has raised and advised clients on more than $50 billion in capital. That's according to its website. Antoine joined us from our New York studios to talk about the private equity backdrop and hear some of his outrageous (laughs) predictions for PE in 2024. We are going back to reality. Right uh, after QE zero interest rates, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we're going back to flight to quality mostly. Mm-hmm. It's obviously tougher out there. It's tougher for exits, as you've been saying. It's also tougher on the investment side because credit is lacking. So we are, I think, going to what I was, what private equity was in the early 90s. Right, adding value to businesses and being smart about investing. So does private equity thrive? in an environment like that? Not all of it. Uh, some of it was just, you know, riding the wave, I guess. And these guys are in trouble because things are now tougher. Uh, for those who know their way within the difficult environments, it's obviously great times. Uh, they can buy great assets at cheaper prices. Mm-hmm. 
uh, they can have less competition and uh, and they can think about you know great growth plans. How are you thinking about using leverage when it comes to buyouts right now? Just because interest rates are so much higher, I think it's it's obviously part of the game. Um, you know, leverage can leverage can can make people rich. It can also hurt or kill. Uh, I think you have to use it with a lot of uh, you know skill. Uh, and that's what most of these guys are doing right now. What do you make of though, kind of, it's all about private credit right now. Do we continue to see, I feel like, you know, traditional Wall Street is saying, wait, I increasingly want a piece of that. Um, how does that impact the market? How does that, you know, impact some of the conversations that you are having with the clients you deal with? Most LPs are indeed interested in, in credit. I, bet. <laughs> uh, I mean, you go to them, they don't really want to know about private equity, nor VC growth, etc. They're all interested in credit. I guess up to a point, at some point, there will be probably too much uh, available. and uh, Money chasing too many things, or not course, enough things. Of course, right? and like everything, you know, it's supply and demand. And when there's uh, you know, too much supply and not enough demand, you're in, you're, in, you're, in, you're in trouble. When you say trouble, though, does it mean that it results in that we see assets being bid up in terms of valuations, and so it, there's going to be fallout as a Yeah, result? and it's going to mean less less. I mean, performance is probably going to be hit. I think it's not there yet, right? There's going to be a few years uh, where the asset class is going to thrive. But at some point, I mean, things go back to the mean. Hey, we should note uh, for everybody who has not necessarily been keeping up, Houlihan Loki is acquiring Triago. The deal is expected to close in the first half of the year. What does this look like for, for your life? What does it look like for the business? I mean, this is a big deal. Do you go on vacation? You sound good. Uh, I'm, I'm not yet the going. Not closed I'm yet. not yet going on vacation. Uh, the deal is not closed yet. We are, we are. We have signed an agreement. We are basically done, except that we're waiting for regulatory approvals. Uh, so we're now much, much stronger. I mean, we will be much, much stronger. But there is something to write being bigger. Like, I think at some point, because there is so much competition, that when you can be a house that offers a lot, there's power in that. And there's there's something about increasing your presence physically that makes it easier. Absolutely, absolutely. I think this is be, this. is there's going to be more consolidation in this space for that same reason. You want to be a giant or, or nothing. Right, and I'm assuming when clients come to you, they want a lot of things that they can play with or work with. Hey, um, you have shared with us your 10 outrageous predictions for private equity in 2024. <laughs> What's your most outrageous? So I've seen the <laughs> Some of them, you know, in the past, some of them did happen. <laughs> uh, so maybe not so outrageous. You know, I guess the most outrageous is probably uh, uh, Carla Icahn and Nelson Pels buying all the distressed funds out there. Uh, <laughs> I think I put the 40 billion number in there. There will be, there will be lots of fallout from funds. Uh, there has to be some, some cleanup. And there aren't many players doing that already. So these guys or similar entities could probably you know, do a lot in that space. Hey, one thing I was really surprised to see on your predictions for 2024 was Amazon creating an online mm -hmm. private equity exchange, the so-called category killer. Carol and I have spoken about <laughs> in the past <laughs> couple of years, the idea of private equity, you know, private equity providers want to access to people's 401ks. They want to make this thing, you know, that just not just high net worth individuals have access to. What do you mean by Amazon doing this? I think the asset class needs fluidity. A few, a few years ago, it wasn't really needed because the retail investors were not playing in that game. Today, it's a complete different story. And they, I think these people especially need to know that there is a way out, right? But that's one of the reasons why returns have been good is because it's in you get that high return in exchange for locking up your money for you know, 10, 12 years. Yeah, but you can still get a very decent return even if you leave the show you know, in, the, in, the, in, in between, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's an option. It's not, I guess that most people stay where they are and 99% of the paper, the private equity paper, stays where it is. Uh, trades account for roughly 1%. My bet is that, especially if such tool exists, uh, you know, we may go to 5%. I love this one, though, about Michael Jordan, Serena Williams, and Blue Owl. Consolidate private equity sports investments. I mean, sports private equity, man, it's a love affair. Again, a prediction. A prediction. <laughs> prediction. Yeah, a prediction. Don't, don't this like one, This one could happen. <laughs> um, I don't know about the names. I don't know about the people. But, but there's private equity and sports, yeah. as you said, is a love affair. And there's a lot to be done in the space. And it's still pretty, you know, uh, there, it's, it's, I mean, there, there's much more to be done. Our thanks to Antoine Dreen, founder and chairman at Triago. Okay, so Antoine just now talking about private equity's involvement, their so-called love affair with sports. 
Private equity, also well-known when it comes to content and Hollywood, at least now. That brings us to the Bloomberg Business Week cover story. It's about the masters of hipster cringe that now have hardware <laughs> and some Wall Street cash. Love this story. And in fact, it is available in the new issue of Bloomberg Business Week, which is available on newsstands now, online and on the Bloomberg Terminal. It gets inside A24, the indie film company behind the films Uncut Gems and Lady Bird, and the award-winning TV hits Euphoria and Beef. In 2022, A24 raised $225 million from a group of investors, including private equity firm Stripes, that value the company at $2.5 billion, a staggering amount in the indie film world. Felix Gillette wrote the story. He's media, entertainment, and telecom editor for Bloomberg Businessweek. He's also the author of It's Not TV, The Spectacular Rise, Revolution and Future of HBO. Felix began by talking about A24, bolstered now by Wall Street riches, as it's making a run at scaling up its indiness. Yeah, it's kind of a fascinating time for the company. They've had this amazing run over the past year. They started as an indie film distributor, which is a very unglamorous role. And just by having good taste and picking good movies and doing a really good job of hyping movies, you know, small budget movies that they picked up at festivals, they've grown into this force, somewhat of an outsider in Hollywood. And yet this year, if you look at the Academy Award nominations, they again have two nominations for Best Picture, Zone of Interest and Past Lives. They've kind of mastered the art of the small you know, five to ten million dollar budget movie, you know, original voices, auteur driven. And the problem with that is those movies don't make a ton of money. Um, And so, you know, they, they raised all this money, they have this high valuation, and the next step in their evolution is really to grow into, you know, what you might call a mini major in Hollywood and try and basically start making bigger movies, maybe not like, you know, Marvel size movies, but in that range of, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 million dollar budget movies. And to do that, um, you know, you have to take bigger risks. Uh, It's not as easy. You have to move into new genres, which they're really trying right now a lot of different things i mean it's kind of fascinating to see all the different intellectual property they're buying up they're working with bigger stars they have their first movie with the rock is in development felix companies like this i'm always like i mean who are the people behind it like how did you know tell us a little bit about kind of their origins and and how it all came up on your radar i think the one thing that really distinguishes them from a lot of the indie film companies we've seen rise and fall over years is that they do have very strong roots on wall street So Daniel Katz, who's the CEO of the company, uh, before he started A24, he did a stint at Guggenheim and he was running their uh, entertainment uh, investment division. And also, but just like not talking about their business very often um, and letting this kind of mystery void and filling it with, you know, they have these they have apparel that sells for a lot of money online. They kind of do these like sneaker drops for like A24 hats and A24 <laughs> tote bags, which is hey, it's the world we live in, right? <laughs> so I, th- I, yeah. I kind of want to go a, def- a couple different directions with this. You mentioned the New York angle here, Felix, and, I, and I'm yeah. wondering how geography plays a part in this, because when we think of, of Hollywood, we think of literally Hollywood. Does that geographical <laughs> yeah. distinction matter? I think it does. I mean, I think they play up their outsider status and they have a lot, they've had a lot of success with that. I mean, in some ways, the business model is very similar to what Miramax did in mm. the 80s. And That's what 90s. it reminds me of. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very similar. And I think they did, you know, consciously model themselves after that. Um, you know, if you look at their mix of movies, it's always been kind of like a mix of really highbrow kind of Oscar bait movies. And then at the same time, they do horror films. And if you look at A24, yeah, they have these two best picture nominees this year with zone of interest and past lives but they also their top you know probably most lucrative film that they had this year was a horror movie talk to me so having that kind of highbrow mix is very much like miramax the difference obviously is that miramax uh with the weinstein brothers you know they were very out there in the press always throughout their rise before they sold to disney and a24 very much took an opposite approach in terms of their company culture and uh, how they present themselves to the world. 
Well, the first paragraph alone, we've had been fun reading it in the newsroom. I'm not going to tell anything more because there's a movie they made. It was a musical, but it maybe isn't for the family. Yeah, so. Can't read it on air. <laughs> um, always love the stuff you do. Felix, thanks so much. Um, Felix Gillette, media oh. entertainment and telecom editor for Bloomberg Business Week. This is the cover story of the new issue. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plenty ahead in our second hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week, including Elon Musk's underground tunnel project that was supposed to be the next generation of hyperspeed mass transit and instead has hit a muddy and, dare we say, toxic roadblock. While the boring company's tiny Las Vegas loop is less hyperloop and more stories of chemical burns, broken promises, and a puddle of toxic sludge. Also ahead, well on the topic of Elon Musk, we've got everything you need to know about driving Tesla's polarizing electric pickup. You know it. It's the Cybertruck. Elon and Detroit automakers got a break this week on the Bloomberg exclusive news of the demise of Apple's car program. We got the details from Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, who broke the story. Yeah, so we've got a lot on cars and Elon and Apple in the next 60 minutes. First up, though, this hour, Tim, here's a surprising stat. Almost 52% of recent college grads are working jobs that do not require a college degree. This is what is referred to as underemployment. It's kind of staggering. It is, and I think that's why people are questioning whether or not it's worth it to go to college. Yeah, it's a really good question. And for those who do find themselves underemployed after graduation, it can be incredibly difficult to get career earnings on track. It all just kind of builds from there. Okay, so on that theme, and with the cost of attending a top-ranked U.S. college now pushing close to $90,000 a year, yeah, you heard that right, Hmm. it does have many people wondering if a college degree is still worth it. Our next guest, well... He says it is. Jim Keyes is the former CEO of two Fortune 500 companies, Blockbuster and 7-Eleven, also the founder of the nonprofit Education is Freedom Foundation. He's got a new book out. It's called Education is Freedom. The future is in your hands. He joined Carol in our New York studio. We're in a unique bubble right now, with three and a half percent unemployment, and there are a lot of jobs out there that don't require a college degree that are very well-paying jobs. The question is, where will we be when we have seven, eight percent unemployment? Because, of course, these things are cycles, and right. it will happen at some point in the future. And that degree will help you differentiate yourself. Think of it as your brand. At some point, you're going to have to raise money. You're going to have to apply for a job. And not having that degree will make it difficult to compete with others who do. You know the stories about the amount of student debt that's out there. And kids who've gotten college degrees, they're indebted, and it's taking them years to pay it back because they haven't gotten necessarily a job that has made it easy to manage that debt. Well, I'm going to give you a classic business example. Yeah. You would never invest in a company based on today's returns. You'd best you basically run a net present value of future earning streams and discount it back for today's dollars. I'm not sure why we don't look at our at college as an investment in ourselves because it's not going to pay back in today's dollars, but it will pay back over time if you look at all of the statistics about having a degree versus not having a degree. Now this doesn't hold for every degree that you get or every job that you have. But on balance, that degree does give you far more earning power over your life. And here's the way I like to look at it. Getting a college degree is an investment in yourself that pays dividends for the rest of your life. Right. So think of it as a business investment in yourself. It's interesting because you are so all in on education. Oh, yeah. And it's interesting when you've got schools now that are 60, 70, 80, 90 thousand dollars a year that automatically make it kind of problematic for some people to afford them. And that, again, they have to you know, tack on a pile of debt that doesn't go away so easily. I, yeah, I had to address the same thing because I've had people, now I'm out there on social media, I've got kids going, yeah, it's easy for you to say, Boomer, you know, you, you, you had it easy. <laughs> college was cheap. So I, I, I ran the numbers. And when I graduated from college, my tuition was $7,500 a year. In today's dollars, it's 55000 a year. So yes, it's a little bit more today, but not extraordinarily higher. And this is a really important point. Endowments have been massively improved 
today versus 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And college discount rates, this is a really important factor that no one takes into consideration, are as high as 45, 50, sometimes 60% discount rate. In other words, the amount of scholarship money that they provide. So beware being intimidated by the sticker price because the actual price may be significantly less. The thing I will say about scholarships, having gone through the college route with my own daughter, in that there's not a ton of academic scholarships anymore. There's a lot on the sports side of things. And then there's a lot on, depending on your economic well-being or not so well-being. And I'm so glad it's there you know, for that. But there's a lot of people in the middle that kind of get stuck with that debt load. There is. The middle is tough, and it's always been tough. And I, I guess if you look back in, at history, this is not unique to today. We've always had that challenge of kids that really can't afford it are in a much better position to get scholarships. The, the kids who can't afford it almost doesn't matter. Is that middle group that are challenged. But again, I, I can't stress enough from two perspectives. From the individual's perspective, right. it's critically important to differentiate yourself down the road and make that investment. But for a corporation, you know, you remember I, from, your, from my bio, I ran two two Fortune 500 companies, right. we had a hard time em employing an educated workforce at that store manager level. And that's even more challenging today with 3.5% unemployment. So if we're going to be competitive, if our corporations are going to be competitive 20, 30, 40 years from now, we better step up and recognize the importance. We'll go there because I do feel like before the pandemic and very much so after the end pandemic, the, the role of the corporation in kind of taking care of employees, what do you think should be the role of employers when it comes to helping to educate their workforce? Here's the way I look at it. It's a, it's a classic, I can't help but turn everything into a classic business problem. It's supply it's okay. and demand, right? Yeah. We're the demand. Businesses are the demand for an educated workforce. And yet we very rarely make the investment in that education, state and local government that trains public school kids. And so today, my recommendation in the, in the book, it's a bit of a call to action to corporations to see the need for investing. And how do we do that? Through technology. You know, we, we've, we've got such an opportunity to transform education with things like AI. How we do it. Yeah, digital learning. Um, there, there's so much opportunity, but that's not gonna happen at a state and local government level. So who needs to do it? The companies? I, I think corporations should, and ultimately I think they will once they realize that this supply and demand problem is a is a problem. I'm going to kind of go back to some of the stuff you and I were just talking about on air. Peter Thiel, who has said, eh, you don't have to go to college. Wrong? It, it, it's, <laughs> <laughs> if Peter was here right now, what would you say to him? I would say, please stop. And, and, and here's why. If you give a young person an excuse and say, you don't need to go to college, they're going to take it. They're going to take it. So just step back from this and think about global competitiveness. The United States, since about 2012, 2015, has gone from high 50s in graduation, post-secondary graduation rates down to 40. Now, COVID contributed to right. that decline, but we're going in the wrong direction. Meanwhile, China has gone exactly opposite. They have gone from the 40% range up to nearly 60 and climbing. They're doubling down on the importance of an educated populace and an educated workforce. And this, this issue is critically important to corporate America if we dial forward and our ability to sustain competitiveness will depend on an educated workforce demand for the supply that is lagging right now. What's the answer? And I think about, I mean, I'm one of seven kids um, and my parents, it was all about getting a college education. That was so important. My dad came out of World War II, a GI, GI Bill, went to college. Like this was from the get-go, you can do whatever you want after you go to college was kind of the mission here. How have we gotten away from it in your view? Yeah, we're in this weird bubble of the availability of technology, but not the application of technology. And some of it comes down to how are we funded, state and local governments, the challenges of, of that Because we spend process. a lot of money. And we are spending a lot of money, but we can spend it far more efficiently. I don't think the solution will happen leaving it up to state and local governments. I hope that corporations will see that they are ultimately the demand and want to step up because the technology is available today to completely transform the way we teach and the way we learn. We saw a little, you and I were talking about you know, during COVID. During the pandemic, yeah. Yeah, during the pandemic. Wasn't so great for some. It wasn't so great for some, but here's what happened. It was ma a massive, um, 
improvement in the availability and access that wasn't there particularly for the underprivileged it's there now what we haven't done is integrated those platforms up, upgraded the user content to make it eye popping so those kids that were hating their online class would then play video games for four or five hours right, right. so you can make school just as engaging that's the challenge and, and that will come that's our next step but do we have to be careful about technology yay great Right, Jim. But I mean, I also think about um, the importance of part of school is social skills, learning to communicate. Like, like exactly. What's the balance here? Well, and that's too. You just made my point. That's why a formal education still is and will be important for quite some time because it's more than just learning. You can learn online virtually anything. Right. But it's those we meta do, skills. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's those meta skills. It's those soft skills that I've I've outlined in the book. Things like curiosity, uh, creative, um, creativity, um, critical thinking. Those skills are things that you hone. In a, in a classroom working with others. If there's one thing, one thing you could change or one step that you think, and I'm assuming it sounds like what you're saying is it's on the side of corporations to really step up here, what would be the step that the world needs to take to improve this? Well, the first step I think is we've got to get beyond fear because I think fear is the big culprit here. You write it's, about that in the book. It, I write about, I've got a whole chapter on fear and a chapter on confidence because confidence is so important for learning right. um, and preparation. But fear is the killer because we're afraid of so much. We're afraid of, some of us are afraid of teachers unions. We're afraid that kids are being indoctrinated. We're afraid of you know, this and that and this and that. All these horrible things that are buzzing around and it's contributing to this narrative that maybe you don't even need school. Huh. Well, if we can reverse that fear, and you think about the antidote to fear, it's knowledge. So if we can, ironically, if we can reverse the fear, replace it with knowledge and understanding and confidence, then I believe that will help us recognize the opportunity because we are there right on the cusp of being able to completely transform the way we teach and learn. If we don't do this, what do you think is the outcome or the impact? In our country. I, I am concerned both for our corporations and global competitiveness of America, but also for the country itself, all the way back to Jefferson. Yeah. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville came from France and said with Jefferson that the sustainability of a democracy depends on an educated populace. And you get into this, this whole idea of the polarization that we see. You believe that this is going to be the way that we get rid of some of that, right? And I do. I believe it's ultimately the solution because so much of this polarization is fear. And going back to FDR's and uh, yeah. indoctrination speech, all we have to we have nothing to fear but fear itself, right? And we are in the grips of fear, and it's just taking us down. It's it's dis distracting us from so much potential to move forward as a people. Our thanks to Jim Keyes, former CEO of Blockbuster and 7-Eleven, and the founder of the nonprofit Education is Freedom Foundation. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Coming up, it was meant to provide fast and convenient transportation to the Las Vegas community. Instead, it's racking up safety violations. How Elon Musk's Vegas Tunnel Project is causing chemical burns to its workers. That story is next. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Tim, Elon Musk and EVs. Uh, check. Uh, Elon Musk and satellites and space exploration via SpaceX. Uh, check. Uh, then there's the brain, Elon's Neuralink project. Okay, some news there recently, too. <laughs> so we can go ahead and say check, I think, at this point, but don't sign me up for it. <laughs> and what we haven't heard much about in a while is Elon's tunneling venture, The Boring Company. That is until now. I think it's fair to say uncheck on yeah. this one. <laughs> exactly. Well, which is why our Bloomberg Business Week team had to take uh, do some digging around, no pun intended. <laughs> they found out that The Boring Company's tiny Las Vegas loop is all that's come of Musk's promise and his promises overall to build super fast mass transit hyperloops. Workers say its tunnels, meantime, are packed with chemical sludge. This is a story by Max Chafkin and Sarah McBride of our Bloomberg News team. Max is Bloomberg Business Week columnist, also a contributor to the Elon Inc. podcast, a new episode dropping tomorrow 
on the Bloomberg terminal and on Bloomberg.com slash Elon Inc. Uh, Max is, is here it, in our Is it called the sludge studio. episode? It's, yeah, it's a, it's a sludge special. Um, <laughs> since we talked about the sludge, we got to start with the sludge because it's it's actually kind of serious, pretty serious We're stuff. We're laughing, that, but yeah. It uh, causes some pretty bad health effects. Yeah, so I mean, the genesis of this story are these documents that we obtained, that Sarah McBride and I obtained um, from the state OSHA, uh, that's the Occupational Health and Safety Administration. Um, and it basically shows lots of complaints from workers about unsafe conditions, including this issue of like these toxic muck, uh, which the workers say they've had to wade through. Uh, the reason it's toxic, it's not its not necessarily like they're doing something that's totally outside the norms of tunneling. Um, the, these chemicals are, are sort of standard chemicals that are used, but the allegation from the workers is that corners are being cut, they're trying to move too fast, they're doing it on the cheap. You know, and the funny thing about this, or it's not really funny, but these are the things that Elon Musk has set out to do in so, to some extent, like the whole point of the boring company like many of Musk's companies, has been to cut unnecessary costs. The thing that we're hearing with this story, however, and I think you see echoes of this elsewhere in Elon Musk's empire, actually, is that they're not necessarily finding lots of innovations there. Mm -hmm. They're ultimately ending up with a normal tunneling company, essentially, uh, that happens to have a safety record that some would say is troubling. Okay, mm -hmm. so here's, here's what's a little puzzling to me, Max. Elon Musk is a guy who's literally putting chips in people's heads. He's doing something that only until SpaceX did it, uh, governments right. taking a whole of government approach could do. Um, we've been able to dig tunnels for transportation purposes for over a century. Why is he running into so much trouble here? So I think I wrote one of the first stories about this back in early 2017, talked to Elon Musk at the time about this. And and just to put a slightly different spin on what you what you just said, and which, which relates to this, which is that SpaceX is not the first company, not the first private company to build rockets, right? The the, the shuttle, all the things that NASA had done were built by government contractors. Right, um, but what, I guess what I'm saying is they're, yeah. he's doing it in a way that is really innovative. I mean, well, yeah, 100%, very much. Reusable stuff is, that was a real innovative contracting process. They they used contracts. They sold them directly to the government at a fixed price, which was new. Um, but the, one of the core things that SpaceX did was like go out and look for existing technology and find a way to approve, improve on it and do it cost effectively. Now, there are a lot of potential inefficiencies in the world of aerospace. And Musk has had a much harder time in some other fields, finding similar sort of levels of inefficiency, just sort of low hanging fruit. And I think the tunneling example is one. You know, he talked about, back in 2017, he talked, you know, it, it costs a billion dollars a year, and it takes, like, takes a mile, it takes a year to dig a mile, and it costs like a billion dollars a mile, or some, some very large figure like that. And now Boring is doing maybe a little better on cost, although it's hard to know, but when you look at the actual pace that they're going, it's basically a mile a year. It's, it's not, that much faster uh, than than existing tunneling projects. And when you look at the end result, we're not talking about mass transit. We're not talking about, you know, big subway cars full of people, which is actually what many people in Las Vegas, you know, would have hoped for, because um, traffic there is really bad. What we're talking about our Teslas, just normal cars that can take three people and a driver. They're not even driverless, um, and, and they're limited to, to 40 miles an hour. So we're so far away from the kind of grand visions. And just to remind people, um, what Elon Musk originally promised here was new New York to DC in 29 minutes. San Francisco Sign to Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, in 35. Sounds awesome. You could right. commute from, you know, you could like commute halfway across the country. Um, and, and you know, it just hasn't gone that way. And I, and I think, you know, in all sorts of different ways across Elon Musk's empire, you're seeing maybe fissures, cracks, ways in which the promises are not necessarily um, matching up. You know, we we saw this ruling with pay uh, in Delaware. You know, of, of course, lots of do problems documented at, at X slash Twitter. Um, and here you just have like a very visceral way where you have these grand promises. In the end, what you have is basically a glorified shuttle bus system. It doesn't take you, you know, from one end of the country to the other. It takes you to, from one end of the Las Vegas well, Convention Center to the other. Is it just a case of that's all it can do so far? <laughs> the plan <laughs> like, here, like, yeah. I mean, to some extent, yes. I mean, the, the, the thing that, if you squint, and I think the reason that this was approved, um, it's partly that it was approved because Las Vegas um, is a low regulation city. These are mostly on private property. There isn't a ton of oversight from the government uh, as there might be in other places. But also, you know, they're talking about opening these stations throughout the city. But, you know, when we talk to people on the ground there, 
it is a long way from happening. It's also hard to see how this is going to make a huge impact on traffic. Again, when you're talking about you know moving people three at a time very very slowly, a lot of things would have to happen. Right. And and there are lots of reasons for skepticism. I mean, you know, digging underground um, is hard. There's a reason it costs so much money. It, it costs so much money because there's stuff you can run into, complicated property rights, and of course. So the company's issues. not going to create a trillion jobs. Well, Yet. yeah, which is what Elon Musk <laughs> told me back in 2017. They were going to create a trillion jobs. I'd say hmm. it's it's a long way from that. Um, uh, to put it to put it mild, mildly, I mean there there was. Uh, sort of flirtations or talk of various projects. There was one in Maryland, one in Los Angeles, one in Chicago. And in, in all these cases, you know, he was bringing along some of the most famous politicians in the United States. So it was Larry Hogan, you know, governor of Maryland, who, former governor of Maryland, who was, you know, at the time a big star of the Republican Party. Um, you know, uh, Rahm Emanuel, you know, former chief of staff to President Obama, mayor of Chicago, Eric Garcetti, star mayor of Los Angeles. Like, a lot of people went for this, and they just, you know, they haven't been able to deliver. And I, th I think there's probably some element of distraction. Obviously, Musk has a lot going on. And also, I think just tunneling, this is hard. You're dealing with dirt wait, and, and putting muck people and up stuff. in space and stuff in space is really hard. Tapping into the auto That's what industry. I'm I mean, this is like going back to Tim's point, right? How many times we're like, you know, you count out Elon Musk or whatever, right. and then he's like, whoa, look what he did. And I understand there's a lot on his plate right now, and and that's got to be distracting. But should we not rule him out? Has he not found the right boring tool? Is What is it, Max? Well, I would say... I mean, I think it's there's probably a bunch of different factors going on. I mean, one thing that was different with SpaceX is you had a very interested buyer, which was NASA. You had the U.S. government wanting to finance this thing, right. looking for, for somebody just like Elon Musk, and Elon Musk sort of finding a way to fit himself uh, you know, to, to sort of make himself look like the thing that the U.S. government want. Elon Musk is really good at this. We're seeing this with Starlink as well, where like, you know, he's this, what would seem like a civilian technology, these these internet services for, as Musk I told it to Walter Isaacson, I think he said, you know, it's to Netflix and chill. Increasingly, this looks like a potential military tool. This hmm. is going to, this is going to lead to government contracts and, and, and could be a big line of business for, for SpaceX. You know, I think what happened is in 2016 and 2017, Donald Trump becomes president. Has, there's a lot of talk about infrastructure. And, and in general, there's been a lot of talk about wanting to spend public money on infrastructure, but there hasn't been a ton of delivery, right? And and I think a big part of this was predicated on this, you know, trillion dollar, the thing that Trump was saying, which was like a trillion dollar infrastructure plan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ultimately, infrastructure, whether it's Elon Musk or anyone else, is very expensive. It's politically dicey because you have land rights and so on, and and it just it just hasn't come together with the speed that SpaceX came together. Max, I I, I want to dig into something that you said that you mentioned a little earlier, which is the idea that back in 2017, 2018, a lot of politicians were kind of jumping up and down with the idea of of collaborating with Elon Musk. What I noticed in your piece is that that tone has totally shifted. And there are now local politicians who are saying, hey, thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, including the mayor of Las Vegas, who is, you know, Las Vegas is an interesting place because the, the city of Las Vegas actually doesn't contain most of the strip. So it's mm. not like she has oversight over all this. As I said, a lot of it is on public property. But but Caroline Goodman, the mayor, um, longtime mayor, her husband was a longtime mayor. She's like one of the probably the most famous politician in Las Vegas is essentially criticizing it and, and criticizing it on the grounds that it's impractical. She, you know, from the start has has raised these safety concerns, which I think in, look prescient when you look at this uh, OSHA thing. Um, and, and yeah, and she's essentially saying, you know, this would be great if it could actually happen, but, but I don't see it. And, and that, again, that is, that, that does represent a bit of a departure for Elon Musk. You do feel like in Las Vegas, at least, you know, some of the magic, some of that kind of Elon Musk stardust, it just doesn't feel quite to, you know, shine quite as brightly. Maybe that's the lights of the strip drowning it out. I don't know, but, but it definitely feels like there's something different going on there. All right, back to the workers though and their conditions. Uh, is this something unusual in terms of infrastructure projects? And I, I'm always a little wary when there's a, a line in your story, although no one has been killed at a boring company uh, work site so far in Vegas. Uh, it does just speak to how tricky it is. Yeah, as I said, these are not like, no one's saying they're using chemicals that are worse than, than anybody else. Um, what, what, what the workers are saying, what you see in these OSHA complaints 
are sort of like little things that maybe add up to a dangerous situation. And, you know, we have seen similar stories like this around Tesla's car factories, around, their, you know, Reuters had a great piece uh, some weeks ago about, um, you know, death at a SpaceX site. So, you know, I mean, when you're, when you're radically trying to cut costs, when you're going around telling people that the only law that matters are the laws of physics, right, I think, I think to some extent they're going to be cost of that and 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 we're seeing that and and but we should say like this isn't this is probably right. more an indictment of boring company being less innovative rather than it's like the most dangerous place in America. You know, there just hasn't been Proof Rock 3 yet, Max. And that, by the way, is the <laughs> tunnel boring machine. Read the story. You'll find out more. <laughs> yeah, which is, you know, promising, over-promising and under-delivering. They have good names, those tunnel boring <laughs> Yeah, TSLA would be proud. Of course they do. All right, Max, thank you so much. Max Chapkin, he is Bloomberg Business Week columnist. Story featured in the new episode of the Elon Inc. podcast on the Bloomberg and at Bloomberg.com slash Elon Inc. 1130. Big news this past week. And by big, I mean really big. In the tech space, in the car space, it was a Bloomberg exclusive by Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. And what Mark found out Apple is abandoning plans for a self-driving car, giving up on billions in potential revenue and the dream of selling what one executive called the ultimate mobile device. Apple reached this crossroads Tuesday when it told employees it was winding down the car project and reassigned some of the staff to its AI efforts. The decision followed months of frenzied meetings between top executives and the company's board over how to proceed. The sudden demise of Apple's car program is another bleak sign for the electric vehicle market. It's also a welcome boon for automakers. Detroit, those in Detroit, and Tesla perhaps, breathing a sigh of relief as Apple's exit eliminates a potential threat in an EV market that is slowing and frees up a pool of talented engineers who may be out of a job. Tesla CEO Elon Musk wasn't shy about commenting, celebrating the move by sharing a post on his X platform with a saluting emoji and a cigarette. <laughs> For more on the Apple news, we spoke to Mark Gurman, Bloomberg News chief technology correspondent who broke the story exclusively on Bloomberg. Apple officially canceled work on a self-driving electric car. Jeff Williams, the company's chief operating officer, and Kevin Lynch, the company's vice president of technology, uh, who was foremost in charge of the car project, announced to the team, it's about 2,000 people, that the project, called Titan internally, is winding down. There will be layoffs of some hardware people. Hardware people will have the opportunity to apply to other teams. Other people working on the project are being shifted to Apple's AI and machine learning division to work on generative AI products, a key future component of the company. There will, some, there will, some, there will be some people move to the Vision Pro uh, as well with that focus on spatial computing. Uh, but this is a bombshell development. This is a very rare retreat for Apple. This is a project that they've invested over $10 billion in. They've worked on it for over 10 years. It's had many fits and starts. It's had many directional changes. About a month ago, we reported that Apple had reached a make or break point for the car project. We reported that the latest incarnation of the project after several meetings with the company's board of directors was a new budget around a level two plus car. That was a downgrade from the original vision of a level four or a level five fully autonomous vehicle. And they also pushed back and delayed that. Uh, since then, there have been more discussions and executives made the, the final decision uh, earlier this month, I'm told, to completely shutter the project. So again, this is Apple canceling work on an electric car. This is a significant development for one of the company's most ambitious attempts at a new product category in its history. Uh, so this is a very significant uh, day for the company. Yeah, very significant. It's not like it's just, you know, an idea on the back of a napkin. I mean, they had been pursuing, as you said, Mark, for over 10 years. The road was rough, though, in it, in Apple's pursuit in terms of bringing a car to market. I mean, you know this company, for them to step up, the amount of time, money, people, effort that they have put into something like this, um, I don't know, how do you get your head around it? Does it mean just completely done? Does it mean that they could buy into something in the future or they're just saying, this isn't a market for us? 
Certainly, uh, there are considerations on the table to acquire an existing car maker. Uh, obviously, you've seen what's happened in the car industry lately. Rivian has not been doing uh, so hot. Uh, you've seen other car companies struggling, Lucid being one. Tesla has had its own ups and downs. It's a very, very thin profit margin business. It's not the typical business that Apple likes to get into, but there is some risk in abandoning this project. What if Alphabet, Google, Waymo, Amazon with Zoox, some of these other big technology companies, certainly the, the Chinese uh, phone makers, they're all getting into cars. What if one of these companies comes up with a great car idea one day and successfully creates a new ecosystem of its own uh, to rival Apple's and they can risk pulling people away from Apple into a Google car or an Amazon car and getting them on their other products in the ecosystem. So there's certainly some very long-term risk here, uh, but in the short term, um, this may be a good thing for Apple being able to focus resources towards perhaps more promising areas in the short term, like spatial computing and generative artificial intelligence. Well, that's exactly where I wanted to go with you next, Mark. To you, is this more about Apple saying no to a car and less about Apple focusing resources on AI, or is it the other way around here? Is it all about Apple saying, wait a second, the rise in interest in generative AI over the last 18 months has just been massive, and we need to go all in on this such that we need to actually cancel our work on the car in order to do that? It's certainly not, not the latter, uh, Tim. This is Apple making a decision to wind down the car project because they weren't getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. It kept getting delayed. It kept getting more expensive. They have uh, these hundreds and thousands of employees uh, that are brilliant people and we have places for them. Generative AI is a key area. Let's throw them there. There's a lot of artificial intelligence, machine learning overlap. Uh, between work on an autonomous vehicle and what needs to be done for the future of AI on phones and watches and, and earbuds and glasses and such. So it makes sense to reallocate those resources. But don't be mistaken, this is a decision all about canceling the car. They just happen to have an excellent soft landing uh, for the resources that have been invested in the vehicle project. Our thanks to Mark Gurman, Bloomberg News Chief Technology Correspondent. All right, Tim, so no Apple cars hitting the road. And yet, look around. After a two-year delay that began with a smashed window gaffe, the most anticipated vehicle of the year is out and about in the United States. It's not easy to get your hands on one, but our own Hannah Elliott sure did. She's Bloomberg Pursuits auto columnist, and she spent a full day driving the Cybertruck all around Hollywood. And needless to say... She got plenty of attention. <laughs> she joined Carol from Los Angeles to tell all of us why she was surprised that Tesla's futuristic electric pickup truck might actually be worth the hype. I was surprised because we've been talking and hearing about this truck since 2019 when it debuted and really before. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of I roll my eyes and think, can it really be that great? And by now, is it even outdated? We've been waiting for years. And yes, it is polarizing. Yes, the brutalist looks may not be for you, but I have to say it was surprisingly nice. I enjoyed it. It was fun. And I loved seeing all of the positive reactions that people had to it because you don't get that very often these days. I have to say your pictures, which are going out on YouTube and also on Bloomberg streaming, uh, when you shared them with our YouTube producer, Elizabeth, um, I'm like, those are sick. First of all, the pictures you took are just gorgeous in how you set them, but it is a crazy, crazy car. I'm really interested. Interesting. So tell us about kind of the outside and then take us inside. So the Cybertruck, as I'm sure you've heard, is a stainless steel truck. And, you know, this, again, is not new technology. You might remember the DeLorean right. from Back to the Future in the 80s. Did it feel um, like a DeLorean in many ways? Kind of. Look like I mean, not on the inside. Okay. The inside actually feels really modern and nice. Um, but certainly on the outside, it's like if the DeLorean was a truck, it would be that. Um, you know, one cool thing I really loved about it is that the back of the truck bed, there's a rolling cover that you can lock. And that is really, it comes with the truck, you deploy it at the push of a button so you can lock the truck bed, which is really great and practical. Um, and the inside is really modern, clean, very well thought out. I have to give props to Tesla. Of course, we've heard reports about some poor craftsmanship, but this particular cyber truck I drove, I didn't detect any of that. All right. You were kind of renting it for the day, so you had to be probably careful at how much you could push it because um, I know you like to check it out on like different terrain, but tell us a little bit about the ride and what it was like. 
So I wanted to have a very L.A. day with this truck, which, as you might imagine, would involve <laughs> a photo shoot, a coffee run, maybe a lunch, you know, somewhere a little bit fancy in West Hollywood. I even went to Home Depot with it and was practically swarmed there. <laughs> the owner of the truck from Toro did ask that I not take it off road. And that's that's fair. So this truck admittedly was coddled. We don't actually know how it will do over the long term. And we certainly don't know how it would do off road in a real rugged environment. This truck weighs almost 7,000 pounds. Oh. So it's a lot of weight, but also a 600 horsepower and instant torque. So it does feel really fast. Of course, it's silent. The brakes are really great. And the rear wheel steering makes it actually pretty easy to park and gives it some great turning radiuses uh, when you're parking. And the valets, I know when I had them park it at the Chateau Marmont I restaurant. I can't believe you went there. They appreciated it. <laughs> I love it. Listen, you pop into a lot of different cars, a lot of, you know, similar kind of, I don't know, trucks with a lot of heft. I think about the Hummer EV. You write about this in the story, the Ro- Rolls Royce Spectre. I mean, how did it compare to some of the other ones that you might put in this category? Very comparable Um, in terms of driving range, in terms of power, in terms of drivability, I would say very comparable. Um, I actually back to the driving range, you know, Tesla says about 340 miles on a single charge, probably in real life driving, it's going to be less than that. But, um, you know, comparable to the Rivian R1T about the same uh, uh, horsepower. Um, But I will say, again, back to this nimble maneuverability in small clothes sections, I actually felt the Cybertruck for its size really excelled. I I really did think they did a great job with that. All right. But if you're sitting in the rear seat, it ain't so comfortable, right? Because I mean, if you look at the roof, (laughs) the pitch is pretty rough. Yes, as with any truck, the rear okay. seat is a little bit compromised. And with the cyber truck, you've got this steep r- roof line that is almost like a triangle shaped. And it does compromise the rear headroom a little bit, especially if you're really tall, you might notice it. So you're not going to want to put your tallest friend or your kid brother in the back if he's a big guy. Um, but, you know, it, it wasn't horrible. I would say it wasn't horrible. It's a it's a three person bench seat in the back. It's doable. Favorite thing about it, Hannah? You know, I actually loved how it really caused an emotional reaction for people. Huh. And like I said at the start of this conversation, so many things look safe and ubiquitous and they all just look the same. And I Whatever you think of the Cybertruck, at least they have a strong point of view and a strong design. And at least in Los Angeles, people got really excited about it. I love seeing the enthusiasm. Really cool. And I love how you finish up your story that when your time was up and you had to deliver it, you got up early because you wanted, what, one more cup of coffee in L.A. before you had to give it back? Yeah, I have to say, you know, some cars I'm actually glad to give, get rid of and give back. The Cybertruck, I would have kept it for the weekend at least. It's fun. I, I liked love it. it. Hey, how much does it cost real quickly? So the one I drove costs around $100,000. Okay. Um, cheaper versions cost about 76000 And then we're going to have some higher performance versions coming out later for 120 or so. Such great stuff. Love it. Love the photos. Love you. Love your story. Bloomberg Pursuits auto columnist Hannah Elliott out there in LA. Hannah, take care. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.